So as you, uh, most of you know, there's something truly remarkable about being around fellow alumni sisters. Our sisterhood is powerful, unique, and very special. And sometimes what makes our sisterhood even more special is that our own family continue the, le the legacy of, of attending our al alma mater. To honor this legacy, I would like to call up Raven Jennerson, class of 2017, to do the honor of introducing her mother, the AADC Zagorn lecturer, Caprice Jennerson. So I have to say, um, I've been holding this secret for at least a week, and it's really, really difficult. I know I'm in trouble. Um, I talk to my mom between 5.30 and 6 a.m. every single morning, so to tell you that I didn't tell her that I was introducing her is, is extensive. Um, so I'm honored to read her bio. Um, as an active alumna and past president of AADC Black Alumni Network, Caprice Jennerson, class of 90, helped create meaningful engagement opportunities. She takes pride in having been at the helm during the establishment and the inaugural meeting of the Evelyn Sermons Field, class of 49 Literary Society in August 2016. Caprice was also integral um, to planning the 2016 AADC Band Sisters Conference, Telling Our Truth, commemorating the 35th anniversary of BAN. In addition, Caprice continues to partner with the Bold Center at Douglas for leadership, career, and personal development by providing extensive opportunities for Douglas students. As a criminal defense attorney for 21 years, Caprice practiced in the state of Georgia and challenged um, draconian prison terms, mass incarceration, and racial inequalities in the criminal justice system. She then spent two years in Washington, D.C. as the Senior Resource Counsel of the Clemency Project in 2014, a collaborative effort led by the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers to engage and train more than 4,000 lawyers to prepare clemency petitions for individual incarcerated, individuals incarcerated in federal prisons. Currently, Caprice serves as a dual role at New York Legal Assistance Group, a, leader provide, a leading provider of lead, free civil legal services, as the director of the pro bono and volunteer unit. Caprice leads a team of volunteer management professionals who work to expand the capacity, the capacity of NILAC to serve a greater number of people with unmet legal, civil legal needs. She cultivates and maintains relationships with corporations, law firms, and law schools to engage organizational, organizational goals and to meet the needs of clients they serve. Caprice is also NILAG's first ever Chief Equity and Inclusion Officer. In this role, Caprice serves the organization's key strategists to build cultural awareness, implement diversity and inclusion initiatives, and create programs and policies that foster an inclusive workplace and climate. Um, Caprice represents the organization external as a thought leader on diversity-related topics at conferences and professional associations. Caprice is a graduate of Georgia State University College of Law. Caprice was appointed by Chief Judge DeFiore to the Ad Attorney Emeritus Advisory Council and serves as the co-chair of the Law School Subcommittee of the New York City Pro Bar Pro Bono and Legal Service Committee. She was also nominated for the National Black Lawyers Top 100 for 2019. She didn't, they don't say that she's also an amazing mother. Um, and she is a mother of me. It's just me. Um, and she's an absolutely spectacular, spectacular person, and I'm constantly inspired by her. Um, so please welcome my mother for the 2020 Zagorian Lecture. I am fully aware that there are plenty of Douglas women throughout the world uh, doing amazing things every day. And I am so humbled, really, and honored that you all would see me and acknowledge me for work that I have done just about half my life. Um, so thank you so much for this honor and for all the people in the audience for spending your Sunday afternoon with me. So I'm so glad to be here. So the topic that I um, selected for today, accessing justice for those experiencing poverty, is really an expansive uh, and broad topic. And so what I thought I'd try to do is distill it down. We'll see how that works out, right? I don't want to keep you here all afternoon. But try to distill it down to the things that I think are really most important. Um, to share about the work that I do, the work that the organization does, and then the work that's happening 
really throughout New York and throughout the, the country as we think about access to justice. And so to frame our conversation today, I'm hoping that we could think about three things to focus, to focus on as I am speaking and keep in our minds for, for several reasons, just so that it sets the tone for the afternoon. So generally when we talk about poverty, um, usually we think about income, we think about money. But for today, I'd like for us to think even a bit more broadly that when we think about poverty, we're also talking about access to quality education. We're talking about access to health care, access to um, different things impacting family, housing, right? So it's more than just money. And so as I'm talking about poverty today, I'm thinking about all of those essentials of life um, that people sometimes have real difficulty in accessing. The other thing is, I think when we talk about access to justice, most people think that that's a lawyer's problem. Most people think that that's a problem for the legal system. That's a problem for the courts. But I'd actually challenge us all today to think that access to justice is really a community issue. It's for all of us to be thinking about. It's for all of us as a society and a community to be concerned about whether there are people who are not meaningfully um, engaging and, and having access to justice. So it's a we problem and not just a they problem. And then the other thing is, when we're thinking about poverty and we're thinking about justice, too often people think, well, if someone is experiencing poverty or if they're engaged in the, in the justice system, it's because of their own behavior. It's because of their inaction or some action that they took. And we're not going to think about it that way today. Because actually, poverty and the lack of access to the justice system is really a pervasive and ingrained um, systemic issue in all of our systems, in healthcare, and education, and in the justice system. So it's not simply about someone who didn't budget their money, someone who took out a loan that they couldn't repay. It's far greater um, than that. So I'd like to share with you a little bit about how I got here. Not how I got to campus today, but how, this, <laughs> how and why this work has become really important to me. And I'll share things, a couple of things with you that happened long before I was even born, but are really ingrained in my DNA. So my father, Theodore Alvin Jennison Sr., um, served in World War II. And when he came home from the war, um, the service, I think it's called the Servicemen's Readjustment Act, or the GI Bill, had been enacted by Congress to really help servicemen um, reacclimate into society and help expand the middle class. But my father, a black man who served honorably and was honorably discharged, did not have access to those loans. He was, he was ushered into uh, low paying, hard labor type work. He did not have the benefit of the loans so he could go to school to begin to think about his future family. Um, so he really did all that he could on his own to sort of elevate himself, but he didn't have that opportunity to really be able to buy a home and, and pass on generational wealth to his children to come. The other thing I'll mention to you that my mother, the late Claudette Jennison, grew up in North New Jersey in Hayes Home, a housing project. And it's one of those places where the, those housing projects in New York were designed, supposedly, to give affordable housing to people experiencing poverty. But we know from experience that those places ultimately, ultimately were places that were ridden with crime and violence. Um, and that's where my mother grew up. And ultimately, my parents met somewhere in Newark and settled down in East Orange, New Jersey, which is where I was, was raised. And I remember that the population of East Orange is roughly, oh, I guess 80 or 90,000 people, pre predominantly a black neighborhood, right? 89% black or African American, and still that way today. But I remember in the 60s, when I was 60s and 70s, when I was growing up, that it was still a beautiful neighborhood. I remember tree-lined streets. I remember playing outside until the street light came on, because that's when you had to go in and eat. I remember friends walking to the corner store to buy penny candy. Like, I'm telling you, I had too many Swedish fish back in the day. <laughs> like, I remember other families that lived around us where my family is still attached to today, the artisans and the almonds and the Billings, 
All these families that we grew up with and are still very attached to today. But what I also remember is around the 80s or the 90s, I remember drugs coming into our community like never before. I remember violence, uptick in violence, and crimes that really were more about poverty than they were about violence or people just being bad people. And I remember guns coming into the community when I had never seen or heard of that sort of violence. And all of this was happening all across the country in communities like mine, in black communities. And I noticed what was happening was, what seemed to have been happening over time was the government's reaction, right, was to over-criminalize, to over-police, to incarcerate black and brown bodies at alarming rates. And that's what I remember as I started Douglas. That's how I left East Orange and came to this campus and it's really good to be back today. But that's what I remember as I was leaving my home. And so after coming to Douglas, I had a really fun three and a half years. Um, here, I graduated a little early and then I decided I needed to get away from home because I had never left East Orange at all. Um, so I decided to go to school in Georgia and somehow just stayed in Georgia for 20 plus years um, and practiced law there. But it became clear to me that the reason I chose criminal defense wasn't so much about um, it just being sort of fortuitous. It really had been ingrained in me already from a very young age that there were people who needed protection in our system, right? And so for many years, I um, was fortunate to represent men and women who, who were, for different reasons, engaged in the criminal justice system. And it was important to see them as human beings and not just people who had committed crime. Um, because there were different reasons why people were involved in the justice system. And I remember arguing in state and federal courts, and always, if a judge gave me two or three minutes, that's all I needed, if a judge gave me a couple of minutes, I made sure to mention the over-policing and the mass incarceration. And some judges let me make the record. And other judges would tell me, Ms. Jennerson, move on. You know, very stern. And I would keep talking right up until the point that I thought, thought, thought a judge might say something about contempt. And then, <laughs> I'd move right along. But it was important to be a part of that fight for so um, many years. And I was, I began at the end of my career in Georgia, I was a little disgruntled um, and perhaps a little burnt out and experiencing my own vicarious trauma for standing in court with so many black men who were sentenced to these really long sentences that just didn't even fit the crime. Low level drug offenses and if someone would be sentenced to 25 years in prison or something that just didn't make sense to me. And so I was very fortunate in 2015 that a really good friend of mine, Cynthia Roseberry, who was the project director of the Clemency Project in Washington DC, she calls me and she asks me would I come. And in two weeks, I packed up my entire house and I went. Um, because it was really important to be a part of this work where we were seeing the criminal justice system through different lens. We were actually filing petitions for people to bring them home. So all of those men and women who had served well over 10 years, 20 years, 25 years, we were able to file petitions for them before President Obama and have many of them granted. So we filed, as a part of the project alone, we filed well over 2,500 petitions. And the president, President Obama, granted 894 of them. And I, yeah, it was wonderful work. And I felt really grateful. Ten of those clients were my own. And I kept in touch with a couple of them. Some were so glad to be free, they didn't want to hear my name anymore. <laughs> but a couple of them, even today, still keep in touch with me. But the thing that really started to worry me was what happens to men and women when they are released from prison, having served the time they were ordered to serve, then what happens to them? And what I discovered that many of them then be, join the ranks of those experiencing poverty. Many of them come back to the communities with the only communities that they know. Sometimes they recidivate, and oftentimes, though, they're law-abiding citizens that just are struggling to find work, struggling to get the skills that they need so that they can, um, you know, take care of their families, to have decent housing. But that, that started to really, I struggled with that, thinking about what my next phase would be as the Clemency Project ended. 
And I told myself I would do nonprofit work. I needed to find a mission-driven organization, um, either doing reentry or some work in the civil space. Because most times when people come out of prison, there are civil consequences, right? There are places they can't live. There are jobs that they can't have. Um, so I landed at the New York Legal Assistance Group in January of 2017. And I was impressed by NILAG's uh, mission um, and the breadth of the work that NILAG does, right? Primarily because they touch on so many areas of civil legal services, so housing and immigration and family and matrimonial law and consumer debt. Um, did I say housing? I'll say it again. But they touch on so many areas of, of civil legal services, and I was impressed by that. So I didn't join the organization as a practicing attorney. I actually joined as a part of the senior management team. And I thought in that way, I would have some opportunity to get an overview of all of these practice areas and how people experiencing poverty could benefit. And so my role when I first started at NILAC was as the director of the pro bono and volunteer unit, which in summary means it was my job to external, be the external face of the organization and help the organization expand capacity to find lawyers and other organizations and law students and introduce them to the work that we do so that we could serve a greater number of people in need. And I remember when I started at NILAC, the very first week my boss comes to me and says, there's a reception at the New York City Bar. You really have to go. I've been on the job five days. OK, I'll just go. And I remember, and I can't remember who the, what the speaker was, but I do remember what the speaker said. The speaker said there was 1.8 million people in New York who were facing a civil legal crisis without a lawyer. And I remember pulling out my very new business cards and writing on the back, 1.8 million people in New York, and that's just in New York experiencing poverty without the benefit of a lawyer. That really stunned me. Like for the next year or so, I really racked my brain trying to figure out how could we expand capacity? How could we get more lawyers into the organization? How could I get more people to volunteer, more attorneys to volunteer? But it also made me think, where is this large number coming from, this 1.8 million? And so we know that poverty and the need for civil legal services is, is, is related, right? So in New York, there are 2.6 million people in the state experiencing poverty. And 1.7 of that number is concentrated in New York City. And even here in New Jersey, there are over 800,000 people experiencing poverty. That's a whole lot of people. And those people will have needs in the civil the civil legal service arena. They're going to need help with housing. They may be facing eviction. They may be living in a place where the conditions are so poor and they can't get the landlord to, to make their payments. Um, they may need help with their immigration status, right? They may be um, burdened by wanting to pay child support and just having trouble and not wanting to be incarcerated because they can't pay child support. So there are all these sorts of issues, civil issues, that people face because of poverty. And these numbers, frankly, are staggering. But one thing throughout the country, and particularly in New York, there are these commissions called Access to Justice Commissions. 40 states around the country have an Access to Justice Commission. And the commissions, particularly the one in New York, has been around for about 10 years. Um, and it's a group of 40, I think 40 or 45 people who have been tapped by the chief judge to be a part of this commission and really strategize around how do we bring more services? How do we bring more resources to people experiencing poverty? Now, New Jersey doesn't have an access to justice permanent commission. Um, but if you look at the New Jersey court website, there's a lot of information that's very similar to an access to justice commission here in this state. But other states have really sort of, they've created these commissions and I started looking at the, the um, annual reports of a few of the commissions around the country. I was just curious to see if these access to justice commissions are doing the same or similar things. And what became obvious to me is that there are a few things from a historical perspective that many of the organizations are doing the same, right? 
So for instance, most of the organizations, the Access and Justice Commissions, are focused on funding civil legal services. So on the criminal side of, of the law, you know that if you are arrested and you can't afford a lawyer, that you can be appointed a lawyer, right, if you meet certain criteria. But that doesn't exist on the civil side. So when you go into court for a civil matter, except in very limited circumstances, you are not entitled to a lawyer. So there are so many people who are accessing the civil legal by themselves, trying to navigate that experience by themselves, trying to figure out laws and, and statutes and procedures and rules of evidence, things that took me three years to figure out, and still, sometimes, I don't know. But you're, you're required to come into these systems by yourself and figure it out by yourself, right? So these commissions are very, very focused on funding civil legal services organizations like NILAG, like the New York Legal Assistance Group and others. There are similar organizations here in New Jersey. And one of the largest ways that, that these organizations are funded is through the Legal Services Corporation. The Legal Services Corporation is a private nonprofit that receives an appropriation from Congress every year. Um, and every year there is a fight to get this appropriation from Congress. Every single year there are those who say, we don't want to fund civil legal services anymore. We just want to cut that by some astronomical number. And year after year there's a lot of advocacy that goes, goes into trying to keep the, the funding coming into civil legal services. And so far we've managed since the 70s to keep those appropriations coming. But, but organizations are also funded in different ways, through foundations, through hospitals, and, and various sources. But one of the interesting things that I wanted to point out that I, I'm very proud of is that NILAG doesn't receive funding from Legal Services Corporation and intentionally does not. And one of the reasons for that is the Legal Services Corporation being federally funded is, is really tied to the federal poverty guidelines. So for example, if you're an individual and your income, your income cannot exceed more than $12,760 for you to be able to receive services. And when you exceed that number, if you, if you are going to a, a legal service organization that is funded by LSC, they may not be able to serve you because you don't meet the criteria, right? If you're a family of four, your total household income can be no more than $26,200 for a family of four, right? So the good thing about NILAG, because we don't accept legal services funding, legal service corporation funding, we can serve people who fall outside of that. So we can say we'll serve people within 200% of the federal poverty federal guidelines, which is still a scary number, because that means for a family of four, the total household income is roughly $52,000, $53,000. Still a struggle, right? But at least we can serve a greater number of people who would absolutely be left behind if we accepted money from Legal Services Corporation and had to follow those very uh, stringent guidelines. So the funding of civil legal services becomes a really intricate dance, right? You're constantly trying to figure out, do you have enough money to keep the lights on? Do you have enough money to pay the, the number of lawyers you need? Do you have sufficient grant money? Do you have um, the technology that you need? So this funding for civil legal services is really what access to justice commissions have been focused on for quite some time. And the other thing that most commissions are really focused on is expanding capacity, right? And so as I said, when I started at NILAG, expanding capacity has been my job for the past uh, three years. And so that means recruiting more lawyers to come to civil legal services. That might mean creating better pipelines so that college students want to go to law school. And then when they graduate from law school, they want to come to civil legal services as opposed to going to big law firms that make a whole lot more money or going to government jobs or, or some other private sector job. But also part of the work is trying to get more pro bono attorneys who are at these big law firms and at corporations um, and in the private sector to learn the work that we do to, and be supervised by our team of attorneys um, to help us expand capacity, to bring more law students into our summer programs and our fall and spring programs and to figure out how other skilled volunteers uh, might help us expand capacity to be able to serve more people. And there are a whole host of challenges that come with that that we won't go into today. But that's one other area that most access to justice commissions have been really focused on. And then the third one that I'll mention is this idea of innovation, right? So a lot of commissions are thinking of how do we use technology better? How do we bring 
um, computers to people so that maybe they can, they, or an app, so that people can input some information and an output is some document that they can then go file in court. Or, or at least the, it produces at the end of the app, there's a letter that they can take to their landlord and demand repairs, right, for something in their apartment. And a lot of commissions are also thinking about how can we use non-lawyers? Can we use paralegals? Can we, can we train other people to be able to do some of the work where we, don't, we simply don't have enough lawyers, right? There's some communities that are so distant, these rural communities, where there's only one or two or three lawyers, but the population is larger, and you only have two lawyers serving an entire community. So how do the larger cities bring legal services to these rural communities? And so there's a lot of work going on in access to justice commissions to figure out, is that possible? How do we give out legal information? How do people gain and know their rights? And so in New York, we have a lot of know your rights presentations in public libraries. We have help centers in the court system so that you can at least go in and ask a question of someone and at least get enough information to point you in the right direction, sometimes point you to a legal services organization for those people who don't know uh, where to find services. But even in the face of these things that organizations have been doing for years, these justice commissions have been looking at these, at least these three initiatives for many years, 10 years, sometimes more. Like I think the Washington State Access to Justice Commission has been in existence almost 20 years. So for all of this time, we've been looking at these same issues. And yet this justice gap is still there. This 1.8 million people that I heard about three years ago, pretty much the same number today. So that's really sort of started troubling me. Why, what is this gap and why are we not shrinking this gap? I saw some research a week or so ago that said in the last fiscal year, all of the legal service organizations in New York, at least the larger ones, had served over a half million people, but yet the overall gap was the same. Right, This experience of poverty and needing um, civil legal services doesn't seem to be dwindling. And then the court systems are reporting that so many people are coming into the courts and asking for help and asking for legal services. This gap is stubborn. It's not going anywhere. And what made me think, and what I wanted to share with you all today, is what should we be doing in addition to? So I'm not suggesting that what we've been doing is wrong or negative, I am suggesting that it isn't enough. And what I think we are missing and where I think we ought to be going and really thinking about is, what's the root cause? What's the root cause of poverty? What is the root cause of all of this disparity? And if we don't talk about the racial disparities, if we don't talk about the fact that my dad didn't get that GI Bill so that he could pass on generational wealth to his children, if we don't ever talk about that, then we can't really solve this poverty problem. We can't really solve this access to justice problem if we are too uncomfortable and afraid to have the conversation. And it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to have. In my own organization, I am now the new chief equity and inclusion officer and every day I am uncomfortable. Every day I'm in a predominantly white organization and every day I'm challenging myself to raise issues that we are having internally and externally in the organization. But we have to be more courageous. We have to begin to have these conversations with one another and learn about what are the real issues, not the issues at the end, but what are the historical issues, right? So I was reading, I think it's the, the Race Equity Institute's website one day. And there was this wonderful analogy called the groundwater approach. I've been stuck on this for months. <laughs> and and, and I'll, I'll share what, what, what they said on the top of their webpage. So if you have a lake outside your house, you have this beautiful home, you've got a nice little lake outside, you've got some fish in there, right? And you go out one morning and a few, just a couple of your fish have died. You'd probably say, oh dear, those fish must have been sick. So you scoop them out toss them away, whatever. But let's say you go back out and now over half of the fish in your lake have died. Might be more than just the fish are sick, right? But then let's say you've got multiple lakes 
and you and each day you go out or each week you go out and more and more of your fish are dying. And you get to a point where half of the fish in all of your lakes are dead. So now it's not a fish problem, right? It's no longer a fish problem. And it may not even be a water problem. It's something deeper. We've got to get down to the roots. We've got to really talk more about what's happening at the root. And so the Racial Equity Institute and a lot of organizations are really digging down to what are the roots? We can't keep saying, you know what, slavery happened a long time ago, let's not talk about it anymore. There are implications from slavery that are still happening today that we still have to deal with today. Can't sweep it under the rug, it's still here. Now hopefully there will be a day when it won't, but that is not today. So we still have to talk about it, right? We have to talk about the fact that there are certain things that have happened in our country that were, that were sanctioned by the government. When I stood in court with black men who were sentenced to 20 and 30 years for low-level drug offenses, those were not illegal sentences. Those sentences were sanctioned by the government and wrong, and wrong. Stop and frisk was long, wrong, long before Mayor Bloomberg decided to say he was sorry. It was wrong a long time ago and we knew it. We knew it then when we were doing it. We didn't need years and years to figure out that over-policing and over-criminalization was wrong. We didn't need years to know that there was a crack epidemic in black communities that required treatment, not criminalization. But we put all those people in jail. But now we have this shift. We're talking about opioid addiction and we're hearing a lot about treatment and that's right. I'm not upset about the fact that I'm hearing about treatment, but we needed treatment a long time ago. When people are suffering from mental illness, we put them in prison as opposed to addressing the underlying trauma that people have experienced. Trauma from poverty. Right? Poverty is traumatic, I'm here to tell you. <laughs> it's traumatic. And, but we don't want to talk about it. It is uncomfortable. It may be uncomfortable in this room right now, and I challenge us. I challenge us to sit in it, to stand in it, to talk to one another about it, because that's how we really get to the solutions. The solutions are not on the surface. The solutions aren't Band-Aids, and they're hard. And they're tough and they're gonna take real work. It made me think, I was listening to a podcast last week. Someone was interviewing Brian Stevenson. Brian Stevenson is a really well-known attorney in Alabama who focuses on death penalty work. He wrote the book, Just Mercy, that the movie that's out is, is based on. But he was talking about a particular case that was decided back in the 80s, McCleskey versus Kemp. And McCleskey versus Kemp back in the 80s, uh, a Georgia inmate was challenging the death penalty and basically saying, listen, the death penalty is being applied based on racial discrimination and I shouldn't be killed because only black people in Georgia are being killed. And the United States Supreme Court basically said, and read it for yourself, a little bit of racism is inevitable. And this was in 87, just a little bit is inevitable. And because this particular defendant couldn't show couldn't show that each juror and each judge had done something particularly racist. Couldn't get into their heads and, 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 and point out that they were racist. He couldn't rely just on the impact because he had all the stats. You had all the statistics, not just from Georgia, but from around the country about how the death penalty was being applied. So the fact that the highest court in the land said that racial impact wasn't enough is problematic. It's problematic. And so it really sort of lets you know how deep this problem is. It's, it's not, it's everywhere. It's in our court system. It's in our healthcare system. When black women go to the hospital, they somehow think that we can withstand all sorts of pain. And when we tell them that something is really wrong, sometimes we're not listened to. Sometimes we're not believed, right? This is still happening. It's happening today. I, re I remember when Serena Williams gave birth to her daughter not so long ago, maybe a year ago. She had to really yell at folks because she was saying something's not wrong. I can feel it in my body. She could have died had she not pushed and probably not have been Serena Williams, right? She might not be here anymore because they weren't listening to her tell them what their experiences were. This is the same sort of thing happening in education where young, kid, young black girls are now being pushed out, right? 
our hair is too kinky curly or whatever it is, and our behavior, we're a little bit too loud or whatever they're saying about us these days. And But they're being suspended from school at alarming rates, at alarming rates. And this isn't just happening in New Jersey or New York, it's happening all across the country. It's happening everywhere. So we really have to get to the point that we're talking about this, these things, because I think that's where it starts putting all these brilliant minds of all of you in the room together and talking about these things and coming up with some real solutions and shifting the narrative. Because for far too long we've been saying it's their fault. It's your fault that you're poor. It's your fault that you live in the housing projects. It's your fault that you uh, somehow got ensnared in the criminal justice system. It's your fault. It isn't. There are bigger issues that are in our groundwater things that we have to dig a little deeper and talk with one another about more so that we can find real sustainable solutions. And that's what I'm that's where I am now. And I'm proud to be at NILAG now because I think that we're moving the needle a little bit. We haven't for many years, but I think we're on a new trajectory. I think we're now internally beginning to have greater conversations. Our, my my colleague, our director of communications is here and I thank him for supporting me today. But our narrative is changing and we're saying, we're looking at the systems, we're looking at the structures, we're looking at the institutions now, right? Our own included. And not just pointing the finger at people experiencing poverty and people who need our help. We're not, we're changing our narrative. And I hope that's what we are starting to do today. And so what I think in terms of, for us, right? There's work for each of us. Some of you might be saying, well, I'm not a lawyer, what does this have to do with me, right? If you're in education, if you volunteer anywhere, you have to be asking these questions. If you're in healthcare, if you're in any system, in any institution in the country, in the world, anywhere, whatever you do, and you're not having conversations about this racial disparity, then you're just not talking about anything. Because every conversation you should have should have something to do with what's happening to our neighbors, what's happening to our friends, What's happening to people in our own family? Because I have people in my family experiencing poverty. I have people in my family experiencing homelessness. We all do. We have got to get to the point where that's not okay. Those numbers that we talked about earlier, 2.6 million people in New York experiencing poverty, 800,000 people experiencing poverty in New Jersey, those numbers are way too high. And I think we each have work to do. And if you don't know, Right? It's time for us to start educating ourselves. Forget about what we didn't learn in school. I realized when I got here to Douglas, I didn't learn a lot. <laughs> it was culture shock. But that's okay. That's okay. There are podcasts. There are books. The Color of Law by, by Richard Rothstein is an amazing book that talks about um, all of the systems that we should be focusing on that have real justice problems. The 1619 Project is an excellent podcast so that you can really get dig down deep into the implications of slavery on how we move as a culture and as a system today, right? But there's so many things that we should read to educate ourselves because, see, I just won't be here all the time to give these magnificent <laughs> lectures. So some of the work we're going to have to do ourselves, and we have, we have to be courageous enough, courageous enough to push ourselves, and, and regardless of what you thought yesterday, all of us can change. Regardless of what you thought was happening, learn something new today and then figure out how do we implement that. And shifting this narrative from blaming, from blaming one another, because it really isn't about blame. It's time that we start thinking of solutions. We start thinking of solutions in everywhere we sit. When the AADC meets, they should be thinking about solutions to solve these issues. When all of the other, when RAAA meets, they should be thinking about solutions to address these issues. We've got to be talking about it. When BAN meets the next time, we need to be talking about these issues and what we collectively are going to do about it. And I challenge you with that. What are you going to do? What are you going to do about it? Thank you for having me. So if anyone has questions, comments, thoughts, ideas, solutions, I'm ready. <laughs> hello, hello. 
if we're not an attorney and we want to be able to help with the solution, where can we go and what are things that we can do? So the first thing that I'll mention is that there are organizations like the New York Legal Assistance Group all over New Jersey. Right, So you can look for those organizations, and every single one of those organizations has a volunteer program, I guarantee you. And you don't necessarily need to be a lawyer. I recruit lawyers, but I also recruit non-lawyers. I recruit people who just have really good ideas to come in and help us see things that we're not seeing. You can actually, I'll give you another one, sit on the board of these organizations, right? Because we need people from different sectors. Um, my organization, for historically, has had only lawyers on its board. Bad idea. So we need other people. We need people from other sectors to really be on the boards. Um, and then part of it is, who's your neighbor? Talk to your neighbors. Talk to your best friend from school, from Douglas, right? We can be having these conversations and putting our heads together about where should we go? Where should we be marching? Who should we vote for, right? Up and down the ballot not just for president, but thinking about your state and local elections. And what are those folks talking about? Are they addressing the real issues or are they just making campaign promises that they'll never fulfill, right? So that's what I think we ought to be doing. Caprice, you yeah. land, you exceeded my expectations, but of course I expected that. Thank you so much. <laughs> you hit upon where I was going and each of us can vote, not just presidentially, but locally because that's who determines whose garbage gets picked up right. and when it gets picked up. And when they're at the congressional election, that whole gerrymandering thing, which is the bastardization of everything the Founding Fathers had in mind because you're less focused on the people you're serving than the party that has divided a street in half so that you can keep your cushy job. And sometimes I think that each of us forgets the sacrifices that were made so that we can vote and think only of the presidential election, right. which is just a minor part of this whole poverty syndrome that you're talking about. And that's a challenge to everybody here. So thank that you. we can do, and thank you. Yeah, I appreciate the comment. I thank you for your words. I think you're right on. And one of the things that I think we can do is advocate for the restoration of voting rights. Mm -hmm. The people who have been incarcerated, they are the ones that really know what's wrong with this system. And if they are disenfranchised from making things better, I think that perpetuates the status quo. Absolutely, I agree with you. And, and, and really, I've had so many conversations with people who were formerly incarcerated. Um, and we always think about the worst thing that they have ever done in their lives. But when you have conversations with these men and women, you really see the talent, the talent that we've forgotten about, the lost talent. And they have real ideas and real solutions, and not just about the prison system, which should be abolished, and that's another lecture, but, but about something, about other things, about, about finding jobs, about skills that they wish they had that they don't get as a part of the penal system. Thanks so much for a very, very informative uh, discussion with us. One of the things you mentioned is that the state of New Jersey doesn't have a uh, formal uh, commission for access to justice. Um, but I would note that uh, Chief Justice Rabner has um, impaneled a number of commissions to handle various issues, and some of which do impact on the civil side mm -hmm. um, as opposed to simply uh, criminal. And there is one issue that everybody really could take a look at. Um, Chief Justice Rabner had impounded a commission to look at municipal court reform. And the um, report came out uh, during 2019. And there's a very interesting thing that happens um, really all across New Jersey in many communities, which is the court systems being used, municipal court system, being used as a method of raising revenues for towns. Um, and you would suspect that um, you might have, you know, like more fines being generated in your largest cities. Not so. Um, what essentially is happening is a, a manipulation of the system so that 
people are held, quote, in contempt, but without the procedural protections that would come with the contempt process. And so you have individuals who are, have fines, on top of fines, on top of fines, and in terms of disparity, a system, again, being misused, but which appears to be neutral, has an adverse impact more on particular segments of society. So I would, I would suggest just in terms of a way for us to be informed, everybody could go to the Supreme Court website. Everybody could access the um, municipal court uh, reform uh, report package. And you could take a look at and find your municipality where they fell in the report. And there are many, many communities that are down in South Jersey, in Burlington, just an example, not picking them out, but just giving an example, where these smaller communities have millions upon millions, millions of dollars in, in fines, improperly imposed on individuals. And those fines have a catastrophic impact on persons in the communities. Okay. That's so, I mean, I knew that New Jersey had various commissions that come and, and come and go. I'm a huge fan of a permanent commission only because I mean, I think that you can bring different voices. Sometimes I think when the commissions are lawyers only or folks attached to the justice system, I think you miss some of the ideas that you can get from a broader broader range of, a range of people. Um, but absolutely, that's, that's a wonderful point. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you very much for your talk today. Um, I'm a non-lawyer who works in the city of Newark, New Jersey, and am involved with an organization um, called uh, Volunteer Lawyers for Justice and have done some volunteering um, at an expungement clinic uh, in Newark. So if there's anyone here who's, who's interested, that's a gr they're a great organization. You don't have to be a lawyer. Um, and also, as either an employer or consumer, I think we everyone can influence um, our, our consumption choice. So employ, if you can employ an ex-offender, think about it that way, um, as well as purchase um, or provide, or think about where you spend your dollars um, at companies that employ ex-offenders um, from a consumer perspective. Hi, um, my mom at age 19, uh, was she got a job at the phone company. She was able to afford rent on her apartment. She was on her own. My sister graduates from college. I have a JD. We live at home. Yeah. Okay. And one thing that we're not looking at is that we are preparing. We're doing the work. And I'm not trying to be like, sound like a victim, but the ability for us to maintain what our parents have has become very difficult. And we're not looking at that. So. Yeah. in our country really make it difficult. Make it difficult for us, even after going to college and law school, still make it really difficult for us to maintain for our older parents, right? Maintain their home, health care issues, all of that. So absolutely, I, but, but again, it's where I think it is the systems and the structures are designed that way. I don't think that's by accident. I think we have to really be looking at these structures and, and interrupt them, disrupt them, dismantle them. Um, and start over and start anew. And I know that's really big and lofty and I probably am way too idyllic at my age, but I, I still believe that in my lifetime there's a way to do this work if we, if we are really uh, committed to doing it. Hi, um, just wanted to let you know, um, my name is Mara Sanders, I'm here from Legal Services of New Jersey, which is sort of the New Jersey counterpart to NILAG in New York. Um, thank you very much for coming today and, and for your, your um, talk here. It's, I think it's so important that folks know about this, think about this, and challenging everyone to talk across communities. We're going through sort of similar issues within our own office and our own organization in trying to, um, you know, look at everything through a different lens and really, really look at why we are in this situation now, why we are in, you know, have, have the poverty that we have, why New Jersey has such a segregation um, and so many issues that um, are very challenging in that regard. Um, one thing that I would encourage everyone 
you know, we, we talked about voting and how important it is, voting rights, voter registration, even with, with it across the state, and the census, which is coming up very soon. Um, there are so many concerns about how the census is being done this year, about all of the suppression that's happening through that process as well. Um, the census is going to be an online event to start with, and many of the folks in the communities across the state, people in poverty, will not be able to um, respond in that way. And so by the time we then get to knocking on doors, um, there's a lot of fear and issues of how that's going to work. So to the extent that we can get the word out and help folks to be um, responding and get counted in that census, I think that's critical as well. Um, so those are sort of some of that. But And I'd encourage anyone, if you have it, are interested in working across some of these issues who are non-lawyers, you can contact through us. There are legal services programs in every county, and we can link you up with that as well. Um, but the sort of question I had to you is I'm, I'm, I'm discouraged by where we are at in this election cycle um, and in the questions that are being asked and not asked and in terms of how issues have been framed and not framed. Um, and so sort of this is, put you on the spot, but um, from, from your perspective, what would be the one question that you would want to hear or the one issue or, or question that you would want the candidates to be put to them and answering in a way that they haven't done. So I'm going to confess something to you. Um, although I keep in touch with what the candidates are saying and keep, try to keep focused on politics, I too am really disgruntled with the candidates um, across the board. So I will tell you that I don't watch debates um, I try to get the snippets because, to be quite frank, I don't think any of the candidates are the right candidate to address issues of poverty and, and race in our country. I simply don't think so, based on the history. Um, and when you look at the history, I, I will just say this. So just the other day, I heard a, a snippet from Bernie Sanders where he said he did not realize that the criminal justice system was so racist until he started running for president. <laughs> How did he miss that? How did he miss that? And he's been in Congress for 40 years. How did he miss that? Right? So that's something that was really made me sort of struggle. And I don't know. I mean, I'd have to give that some thought because I have so many questions about poverty in general. I have so many questions about um, our legal system and all of our systems that are so entrenched with disparity and inequity. And I think I'd be asking more questions about how are we going to begin to make those systems equitable, not equal equitable because we have to understand equality talks about everybody getting the same thing but we're at a place where people are starting from way behind right people have been mistreated so differently so long an equity conversation is what does a person need what does a system need to treat people more just and more fair so I mean I think I would ask some question and I can't frame it now but something more about creating more equitable solutions and for me if a candidate doesn't know the difference that's problematic for me. Yeah. So I had to stand and say how absolutely proud of you that I am. Thank you. As I sat there, I almost wanted to cry. I remember this young lady when she moved here from Georgia, and it was at Sacred Path. Yeah. And she was standing with her green on, and so I knew that she was an alumna. And I went over to introduce myself to her, and as she shared, she became the uh, president of BAN and did some amazing things. Had the opportunity to speak to her, so I knew some of her career aspiration, and I hope you're writing that book. I am. Good. I am. Um, but you are definitely fulfilling your purpose, and it's evident by what you're talking about and all that you're doing, so congratulations Thank to you. you. Thank you. I do have a question, though. So in um, New Brunswick uh, at Rutgers, there is a program called NJ Step, and it's about reentry and it's about going into the uh, prisons and providing educations, and so they can graduate with an associate degree um, and then go on. Yep. Um, I was so moved by that that I actually worked with a donor, an alumna donor, who decided to create a fund that basically goes to any woman who has been touched in any way by the penal system to be able to get a scholarship and they come to Douglas Residential College and ultimately graduate. Nice. 
But I see the issues with reentry, and reentry is a huge problem. Sure. Can you speak to that in terms of what uh, NY Lag is doing in terms of that, and what your feeling is about yeah. reentry? So. New, the New York Legal Assistance Group is purely a civil legal services organization, so we do, don't do work around reentry specifically. But I will say many of our clients are probably people who are reentering society, so we do provide uh, services with housing. We do have a financial counseling division, which most um, legal services organizations don't have because it's a non-legal, uh, non-substantive area, but we do talk with people who come to us about, even with your very little resources, how you can learn to think differently about money, how you can learn to deal with some of that poverty trauma. Um, but in terms of, of reentry, it is, as you said, like a huge um, undertaking. And part of it is because uh, prisons and jails throughout the country have removed a lot of the education out of the system, taken books out of the system. Um, so it's very hard for you while you're in custody to make changes, right? It's very hard for you while you're in custody to get mental health care and all of the things that you need that you didn't get before you were ensnared in the system so that you can make changes. And I think we sort of have to start there. So I said, I mentioned really briefly when I was talking that I think our prison system just needs to be abolished. And I absolutely believe that. And it's not, I think it's because our system has become so punitive. And that's all that we think about now is punitive. But we don't think about rehabilitation and we don't think about restorative justice. We don't think about the fact that even sometimes victims don't want these long prison systems because it doesn't serve them. That's not what they're looking for. And if we had conversations with the victims and had conversations with persons who are accused as opposed to putting everybody in prison, we'd come up with different solutions. So I think we have to start doing some of that. And someone else mentioned, and I echo, talking with those formerly incarcerated has been the best thing I've ever done. Some of the smartest people I know are people who were formerly incarcerated. Um, if, if it's because that they've taken the time to really examine themselves, uh, they have some of the best solutions, but we certainly, sometimes what we do is us, the big brains of us get in the room and leave them out and we think of solutions for them. And I think what we have to do is we have to really make sure that we're including the right people at the table to start thinking about what some of those solutions are. And I think we have really have to be diligent because some of it, absolutely bringing students here to Douglas is huge, right? To get an education. But some of that you have to think, well, where is this person living? Because you'd be surprised, there are people that come to college who are living in a car. There are people who come to college who are hungry, right? So we have to think about, do, are, what, are, what benefits are we giving to them to make sure that they can eat, so that they can study, so that they can do well and then provide for themselves? What assistance are we giving them to, so that they can have affordable housing, right? And if they were formerly incarcerated, how are we addressing their mental health issues? Because you cannot tell me that you have been in our prison system and you don't have mental health issues. You can't convince me of that, right? As a, as a criminal defense attorney, I visited. I'm just going in, meeting with my client and coming out. And I experienced trauma in prisons over the 19 years that I served. So I get that people who live that way, day in and day out, being told when to get up, when to lay down, here's what we're feeding you, you can't go to the doctor, you may be able to get you know, some service next week, you have to take this pill, you don't know what it is, but take it anyway. Like, you know, you're telling someone that you have a sore that won't heal and they're just saying, until now they're telling you this arm might need to come off. I mean, these are real issues that I think that we, we have to talk more to people because I don't think if you're sitting on the outside, you don't know what's happening. You don't know what's happening. So I think that's it. It's a lot of conversation. Yeah. So I just want to, to thank Caprice for giving us such a, a thoughtful and just thought-provoking and engaging <laughs> discussion here today. So thank you. So I'm presenting her with this plaque from the AADC. It says the Associate Alumnae of Douglas College extends our appreciation, appreciation to Caprice Jennison, class of 1990, as the Zagorin Lecture for March 8th, 2020. This is for you.